A very warm welcome to Reflections, our devotional Bible study, where presently we're in a three-part series called Growing Spiritually or Spiritual Growth. Today we uh, conclude this series with the, the theme, He is Able. If you have a Bible uh, and like to turn to Jude, uh, Jude then Revelation, it's the second last book of the Bible, and we'll reflect on so, some selected verses today as well. Can't think of a better way to conclude our series than with that great hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. <clears throat> Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassion, eh, fail not. As thou hast been, now forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. On summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. certainly is great. His mercy is new every day. There was a um, pastor who noticed a, a little a kitten climbing up a tree in the backyard and was afraid to come down. He coaxed it, offered warm milk, but the kitty stayed put. The tree wasn't sturdy enough to climb, so he tied a rope to his car moving slowly so the tree bent down. He's hoping to reach up and get the kitten. The rope broke. The tree went boing, and the kitten instantly sailed through the air out of sight. Well, the pastor felt terrible. He walked all over the neighborhood, asking people if they'd seen a little kitten, but nobody had. He just prayed, Lord, I commit this kitten to your keeping, and went about his business. Well, a few days later, he was at the grocery store and met one of his church members. He happened to look into her shopping cart and was very amazed to see cat food. She wasn't very fond of cats. The pastor said, why are you buying cat food when you don't like cats very much? She responded, pastor, you won't believe this. My little girl had been begging me for a cat. I said, well, if God gives you a cat, I'll let you keep it. Well, I watched my child go out in the yard, get on her knees, and pray to God for a cat. And really, Pastor, you won't believe this. I saw it with my own eyes. A kitten suddenly came flying out of the blue sky with its paws outspread and landed right in front of her. 
Well, never underestimate the power of God and his unique sense of humor. I have a, uh, a sign that one of the members made. You see what it says? He is able. And I have this uh, hanging in my office. Uh, this was done at a uh, congregation when we lived in uh, Illinois many years ago. I thought we'd look at some able scriptures today, <clears throat> reminding us that God is able. He's able to do more than we're able to ask, think, or imagine. And so the first able scripture comes from the last two verses of Jude. It's only one chapter. It says, Now to him who is <clears throat> able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forever. Amen. That is how that one little chapter called Jude ends. God is able to make you and I stand. Now, isn't that something? Now, looking at ourselves right now, it just doesn't seem possible, does it? You know, people came from all over the world for a memorial service. Hubert Humphrey, the former vice president of the United States. One person who came was shunned and ignored by virtually everyone there. Nobody would look at them, much less speak to him. That person was former president Richard Nixon. Not long before he had gone through the shame and infamy of Watergate, he, he was back in Washington for the first time since his resignation from the presidency. But a special thing happened, perhaps the only thing that could have made a difference and broke the ice. President Jimmy Carter, who was in the White House at the time, he came into the room. Before he was seated, he saw Nixon over against the wall all by himself. To the surprise of everyone, the two embraced and Carter said, welcome home, Mr. President. Newsweek said, if there was a turning point in Nixon's long ordeal in the wilderness, it was that moment and that gesture of love and compassion. That turning point for you and I is that we have been baptized into Jesus Christ. <clears throat> God said, welcome into my family by grace through faith. Uh, that's what I call victory and security. The question is, how do we long, how do we learn to walk in the victory and security that we have in Christ because we've been baptized into the, him? Um, we need, need to learn to appreciate and appropriate the finished work of the cross and resurrection in our daily lives. Oh, that God would keep us mindful of our baptism. As we died with Christ, we're raised up with Christ. So we have a new life each and every day. <clears throat> now, does that happen automatically? Not at all. Does a wash around a house happen automatically? Nope. Somebody has to put it in the wash. And around our house, that's not me, that's my wife. But I have bathroom duty and vacuum duty and uh, mowing the grass duty and taking care of the yard duty. It doesn't happen automatically. Someone has to do it. Um, we have an enemy who is constantly trying to, to lie to us about our standing before God. He tries to flood our mind with doubts and guilt and shame and condemnation. When What ends up happening is that we end up living below our privilege and calling as a child of God. Now, has that ever happened to you? Well, we have a powerful weapon against that assault. And, and we're reminded, Lord, your mercy is new every day. I'm your child by grace through faith. I've been baptized into you. I'm part of your family. Nothing can separate me from the love of Jesus Christ. Wow, he's able to keep us 
from stumbling. <clears throat> He's able to keep us from stumbling in our walk with Jesus Christ. You know, the dust of the world clings to us in the daily grind of living. You remember how your children were. They can play outside for 10 minutes and, and you wonder if they ever had a bath. There's two types of Christians. Those who go through the week as they've appropriated God's word and are reminded of his love on a Sunday morning and they continue to sing, uh, great is thy faithfulness, Lord, I love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. But then as the week goes on, they wonder why they have so little peace and joy because they're not mindful of the baptism and who they've been baptized in. And they start feeling weighed down by the burdens of life. The others are very mindful. And so they go through the day and the week with a smile on their face, peace and joy in their heart, because they know nothing will ever separate them from the love of God and Jesus Christ. And that's walking in the victory and security of the cross and resurrection that we have in our baptism. There's a story about a pastor who was building a wooden trellis to support a climbing vine. As he pounded away, he saw a little boy was watching him. The youngster didn't say a word. The pastor kept on working, thinking the lad would just leave. But he didn't. Finally, the pastor said, Well, son, are you trying to pick up some pointers on gardening? He said, No. I'm just waiting to hear what a preacher says when he hits his thumb with a hammer. Well, the good news is God is able to keep us from stumbling. And he can help us say, Lord, thank you for the, the nine fingers that don't hurt. Thank you for the, I'm an overcomer in Christ. Oh, thank you for the cross and resurrection. I've been baptized into Christ. It doesn't get any better than that. <clears throat> but there's another able scripture from uh, the book of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. It says, Now to him is to able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we <clears throat> ask or think according to the power that is working within us. God can do far more than we could ever imagine. You know, God isn't limited by our ma imagination, and that gives us encouragement and optimism for living. A man by the name of Dr. Viktor Frankl wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. He was imprisoned by the Nazis in World War II. He was Jewish. His wife, children, and parents were all killed in the Holocaust. The Gestapo made him strip. As they cut away his wedding ring, he thought, you can take my wife, my children, you can strip me of my clothes and my freedom, but there's one thing no person can ever take away from me, and that's my freedom to choose how I will react to what happens. In other words, we can <clears throat> choose to soar and keep our eyes on Christ, or we can say grounded. One night, a house caught fire, <clears throat> and a young boy was forced to flee to the roof. The father stood on the ground below with outstretched arms, calling to his son, jump, jump, I'll catch you. He knew the boy had to jump to save his life, but all the boy could see was flame and smoke. The father kept yelling, jump, I'll catch you, I'll catch you. But daddy, daddy, I can't see you. The father replied, but I can see you. And that's all that matters. And he jumped safely into the arms of his father. See, God sees us. Our heavenly father sees us. That all that it matters. And God grace empowers us even in the most difficult of circumstances. Yes, our heavenly father sees us right now in the midst of what's going on in the world, our nation, or our lives. He sees us. He's able to do far more abundantly. He'll always catch us and nothing catches him by surprise. See, we're not to make things happen. 
we're to get out of the way and let God surprise us. Oftentimes we expect God to act one way and he acts another way. The word able combines power plus willingness to inherit strength and action. Let me share some interesting examples from my own life and ministry. There was an opportunity to get small group ministry started at a St. Luke's church in Putnam Valley, New York. We would be pioneer partners with Stevens Ministry for what was known as Christ Care Groups. But to participate, it cost $2,000, which wasn't in the budget at the time. It didn't look good. Well, I just finished a new member class. A few weeks later, I got a call from that new member and said, I've got $2,000 I'd like to bless the church with. Do you have a need? I thought, yes, we do. And uh, the, the, the church council agreed we would use that seed money to begin uh, the small group ministry. And it was such a blessing to our congregation. We had an average worship of maybe 150 in those days. And practically everyone was in small group ministry during that time. It really transformed uh, the church. It was really quite a blessing. Another opportunity came to bring uh, what was known as the power team. These guys are uh, bodybuilders, uh, very strong folks. They break ice, rip up phone books, and then share the message of the gospel. They go into the high schools and the public schools with uh, uh, feats of strength and then share the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we wanted to bring them in. But that cost $40,000. Well, there was a man in the worship service who wasn't even a member of our congregation. And he offered, I just happened to be mentioning about the power team that Sunday. He offered $2,500 in seed money. And the rest of the money came in. And we were able to bring in the power team. It was quite a blessing to our congregation and community. Surprise, our God is able to do more than we can ever ask, think, or imagine. Do far more abundantly. Then two chaplain stories. When I was at Concordia Village in Springfield, Illinois, I'll never forget the Taylor family. Uh, Mom was very active in our church uh, or the, the, the uh, chapel service. And... Um, Upon her memorial, uh, when we had her celebration of life service, they said, I want you to think very, very big for a chapel gift. And in those days, didn't have a really good sound system or the ability to um, have um, people to view the service apart from being in the service themselves. And so their gift of love was able to get that ministry done which was uh, 20000 some dollars or so, I believe. And when I first came to Merrimack Bluffs, uh, I'll never forget one of the, the their folks I, I visited, uh, really loved uh, seeing the chapel services. I, when he wasn't able to make them personally, he would uh, watch them on Channel 900. So we had kind of a little system already set up. But he said, I have a dream that we would be able to record the church services and we didn't have the capability at that time. So uh, he said, well, I'd like to leave some seed money and a gift uh, to do so uh, when, when I've gone to heaven. And so uh, you remember that, that the, the pipe leaked one uh, Christmas and uh, through, so the, the whole sound system was damaged and with that uh, insurance and the seed money, we have the, the great system we have now, the sound, the high-definition picture. Yes, God is able to do more than we ever ask, think, or imagine. He is able to do. God goes beyond expectation. Now, Debbie Petrie went into pre premature labor at 22 weeks. Trent was just 12 ounces in July of 1985. He could fit in the palm of your hand. A medical textbook said a 22-week-old fetus could not survive outside the womb. 
In fact, no hospital had yet succeeded in keeping a 22-week-old baby alive. But Debbie and her family just kept trusting in Jesus. Now, Trent's veins were too small for intravenous. His digestive system was not developed enough to accept liquids. Even if he did survive, they thought he would suffer severe brain damage. Well, after two weeks, Trent gained weight. Every day, Debbie clung to Jesus. After 10 weeks, he had his first bath in a margarine tub. When he reached two pounds, they had a kilo party. And after five months, Trent went home. The medical staff said, Trent is living proof miracles can happen. And he is a, a healthy adult today. Yes, all things are possible because God is the God of the impossible. There was a children's chorus I used to sing with the kids in the day. It goes like this. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are his, the valleys are his, the stars are his handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. There's no limits to his love, no boundaries to his blessing, no fences withholding his faithfulness. There's nothing guarding against his grace. There's a, a, no container that can hold his compassion. Great is his faithfulness. God is able. God is very able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. Then the final able scripture comes from 2 Corinthians 9, 8. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, we may have an abundance for every good deeds. In other words, that with God's grace, we're able to do whatever we need to do for his glory. Imagine what he can make with our time, our family, our health, our work, our potential, our future, the challenges, our weaknesses, our disappointments, what he can do at the bluffs, our community and nation. You see, the issue is not God's ability, but will we allow our doubts and fears to rob us of all that God has for us? You know, God is able to make all grace abound, even when it looks impossible. He's able to meet us in the dark, uh, darkest moments and draw us into his light. He's able to meet us in the valley of despair and bring us to the mountain of blessing. He's able to bring us peace in the midst of every storm. He's able to make a way where there seems to be no way. He's able to fill us with optimism in a pessimistic society. Now, to better understand views of the world, a researcher placed two children alone in separate rooms. One was a pessimist, the other an optimist. A pessimist was placed in a colorful room full of all kinds of toys. The pessimist was put in a room filled with horse manure. The first child played in the room, but soon asked to leave because the toys were bro uh, boring and broke easily. The optimist soon came to the door, but then rather than asking to leave, asked for a shovel. And so the researcher asked the child why they wanted a shovel. They replied, with all this manure around, I know that there must be a pony in here somewhere. Choose to be an optimist for Jesus. He is able. Well, God is able to make all grace abound to you and to me. God is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. And God is able to keep us from stumbling 
and make a stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy. Well, we started with the sign, and so we ended with the sign. He is able. Say it with me. He is able. One more time. He is able. May that truth encourage you today and in all days. I can't think of a better hymn to close with than if he's able to make all grace abound than that great hymn, Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures through many dangers toils and snares I have already come His grace has brought me safe thus far His grace will lead me home as when this flesh and heart shall His grace allowed us to be part of his family as we've been baptized into Christ. His grace has brought us to this very point in life, and his grace will lead us to heaven. His grace will lead us home. The best is yet to come. One day we'll have a glorified body. There'll be no more death, mourning, crying, or pain. No tears. We're going to be with Jesus. Um. And so we continue to celebrate the amazing grace of God as he fills us with his peace and his joy. And may that grace, peace, and joy be multiplied unto you until we meet again.